so welcome everyone. Um, we're just going to go into the announcements. In today's announcements, we are wishing a happy birthday to Mavis Grange on November 22nd. Um, a special thank you to uh, Reverend Shin for their ministry and leadership. Thanks to the online team of Doug and Sean with the recorded music and hymns by Murphy and the choir. Um, Young People's Ministry, uh, Ebenezer United Church needs you to work with the online Young People's Ministry. Please contact Reverend Shin today at um, his email and Diane McLean at dianemcl at rogers.com. And if you're interested in helping with this growing ministry, um, what else do we have here? Um, this week, the office hours will be Tuesday to Friday at 10 to 2. The lending library is open during the office hours. And church directory, please let Susan know if you are not on the directory or if you have made any changes to your contact information. Tuesday is the board meeting via Zoom at 7.30. Wednesday is the church advent decorating in person at 1 p.m. Thursday, the technical setup is 6 p.m. for Sunday service. Um, Sunday, a choir practice at 9 a.m. And, uh, oh yes, and we have an announcement from Marilyn. So Marilyn, if you could unmute yourself and... I am. I'm here with uh, Abigail. So good morning, everyone. Several committees are happy to celebrate the Advent season of giving with a gathering outside next Sunday after the service. The hospitality committee will be providing a small snack and the outreach committee is promoting the Pregnancy Crisis Center because they are in need of can always double your financial gift. So if you gave $10, it's then converted to $20 of products. Pictures and Jane's info is in the e-news, or you can donate items or money next Sunday for both of those groups. Lastly, Abigail, she is going to show you a red sock. Okay, it's not the one that you might recognize, but the church ones will be available next week for you to pick up. Please support the children and youth as well in their traditional Christmas fundraising to help needy families and children. You, what you do is you gather your coins through December and we will let you know when to bring the socks back. So if you attend a service on the 28th, please stay around. And if not, we would still love to see you in the parking lot sometime after 11.15. The kit committee hopes to chat with you during the week in case you have more questions. So thank you. And let's have a wonderful time of fellowship next Sunday after the service. Thank you. Yes, it's Lord's Day. I welcome all of you to this service. Also, I'm so happy to see you again in this worship. Let us begin the service with a call to worship. Give thanks and praise to the Lord. For God has dealt mercifully with us. Even when we turned our backs on God. God forgave us and restored us to life. Rejoice in God's abundant love. We will continually praise God who heals and loves us. Amen. Amen. This time by lighting the candle, we invite God to our place and heart. We also remind that there is nothing better than worshiping God. He is always good and merciful. The first opening song is today 
More Voices 185, Every Day is a Day of Thanksgiving. Pray for this service. Would you pray with me? God of us all, we thank you for the saints through whom we are mysterious united in Christ, with those who have worked with us and with us in the faith. Although they now rest from their labors in your heavenly realm, we continually draw upon their unforgettable and living examples of excellence and holiness. We are grateful for the way they have shared their lives, struggles, faith, courage, acts of mercy during their lifetimes, so that we might today live better lives of joyful service to you in your kingdom. With them, we pray, thy kingdom come, they will be done honors as it is in heaven. Preserve vivid lessons of their deeds of heroic trust, healing compassion, and sacrificial love. Inspire our hearts to dare to follow in their fearless footsteps. Impart to us the heavenly perspective of eternity that they now enjoy. Help us to gaze steadily toward your face as they did before us, resisting evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they presented themselves. Comfort and bless those who are standing among us, family members, friends, loved ones, whose lives were blessed by those we have named this day. We make this prayer to you the God of all nations, who calls us each to yourself, that we might aspire to holiness and service in concert with the work of the saints of the ages. To you be the glory, praise, and honor for all time to come. Amen. The second hymn we are going to sing today, More Voices 45, You Are Holy. Show us, you 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 show us,
Scripture reading is from Psalm chapter 139, verses 1 to 12. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. The next scripture reading is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Since last month, we have discussed how we can shine a light in the world. And we are going to look at the first way today. This is it, to live in a unity of God's knowledge and love. Last week, I went to a Japanese restaurant in Richmond to meet my PhD colleague. It was a beautiful day, and I happened to come across a couple that was walking toward me. Our eyes caught each other's eyes, and one of them said to me, Hey, I know you. Aren't you a pastor? My first thought was, oh, great. What now? But I said, yes, I am. I'm one of the ministers. They said, thanks for all you did at the conference two years ago. Again, I thank them and we share the information of recent status briefly with one another. After having lunch, my colleague and I moved into Starbucks nearby. We are about to talk about the new retreat project that we are going to do next year. I could feel that a couple would not stop keeping their eyes on me. And they came up to our table and said, hey, I know you, 
I see you on YouTube. Oh my gosh. I thought to myself, when am I on YouTube? Even I don't have, a, I don't have Facebook, our church homepage or previous lectures. The gentleman said, actually my wife attended your live stream seminar last month. I could have a chance to listen to you for free as I worked beside her. This person had seen me and recognized who I was. Small world. Have you ever had that happen? Those infamous words, I know you. I wonder if anyone has ever said those words to you. Maybe you were part of a social event and someone came up and said, I know you. Or maybe you were in a parking lot on vacation. Maybe a family member raised a voice in an argument and expressed to you those three words, I know you. It all depends on the context, of course, and on the inflection of the voice. There is a layer upon layer of meaning to them regarding texture resonance. Let us shift to today's scripture, Psalm 139. A psalm where God says to each one of us, I know you for I love you. It is a psalm that packs a punch on multiple levels as David comes to terms with God's knowledge and love of him. Listen to what David writes. Regarding the depths of God's knowing, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts far away. As you know, I have served several churches as a minister over 20 years. As I suggested some new ideas or new ways to the people in the church, especially at the beginning of the ministry, people used to give me a typical reaction to those, directly and indirectly saying, you don't know me, you don't know us. They would probably write, it would be necessary to take time to get to know one another. As parents try to give some directions or guidance to their teenage children, they use it to make reactions to their parents saying, you don't know me, you don't know our world. But the truth is that parents normally know about their children at least more than children know about themselves. Though the understanding of their children will do not be 100% correct. Is that correct? Do you agree with me? But what about this? God fully knows us. God knows each of you more than you know about yourself. For example, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28 and 30, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered by who? By God. What does this mean? God knows everything in you and about you. Actually, this fact is very important to us. Do you know why? Because this is the reason why we should rely on trust in him, even though we don't understand and don't like to follow his word and direction. God knows you. Everyone says, God knows me. Please don't, give, don't get me wrong. This does not mean that God spies on you all the time. Rather, this means that God knows how we can gain true life, true way, true wisdom, true salvation, and true flourishing. Christ knows what we need and intends to know each of us so that 
we attain what? We attain true life, true way, true wisdom, true salvation, and true flourishing. To be sure, we all might want people to think that we are wonderful and beautiful, clever and fun. But we also might claim to think that we are so examined and so scrutinized as, as profoundly as this, as to say, you really do know me, Lord. And it can be a bit scary, I know. In fact, David continues, you hand me in behind and before you lay your hand upon me. Again, it is both affirming and intimidating at the same time. God truly does know us and we cannot escape that fact. But there is also the dimension of height in this Psalm. David asks, where can I go to escape your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I take the wings of the morning, and settle at the farthest limit of the sea, even there, your hand shall lead me. Your hand shall lead me. One of the most instinctive reactions we can have when we get scared of what people know about us is to run away. We can try to put ourselves physically in a place where we do not have to endure the shame or the exposure of being known. We really don't want people to find us. People don't want others to see their true reality. According to many scholars in North America, that's one of the characteristics that contemporary culture has. Yes, Psalm 139 proclaims that we cannot hide we cannot become invisible to God. However far we run, we cannot escape God's love. We cannot escape God's presence. The good news is that there is an additional third dimension of this psalm. And it takes this discovery of God's knowledge even further. It is cosmic in scope when it says, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sole or Saul, you are there. God's presence is not limited to this life, to this earth. If we die, or if we go into perpetual darkness, or if we go into dazzling light, or if we are buried in the earth, wherever we are, or in whatever form we come to be there, God is with us, beside us, among us, before us. Do you believe this? God is always ever present, no matter what, regardless of feelings, emotions, circumstances. As Paul says in Romans, nothing can separate us from God's love in Jesus Christ. Nothing. Yes, God knows. God's knowledge is so great, but also so focused on you, on me, in his love. In Psalm 139, God says, I know you because there was a you to know and love. Let me ask you, who really knows you? Have you ever let any or another human being see into your soul? On the other hand, do you really want anyone to know you that well? Do you really trust that if someone truly, truly knows you, that he or she would not expose you, reject you, shame you? What is the adage? Knowledge is power. You share, you open your life to someone and now that person knows something intimate about you, what will they do with that knowledge? I'm sure I'm not the only person who has had such an experience of mistrust. 
when someone shares such knowledge in a way that is not appropriate. And yet, when we speak of the knowledge of God, we are speaking of something different. For when we are speaking of the knowledge of God, we are also speaking of the love of God at the same time. Amen. Unfortunately with us in our modern era, knowing and loving have become separate, disjoined. And there is the fear that if others really knew us, they would have power of us, or they would see through us and seize to love us. But God's knowing is not like that. With God, knowing and loving are identical. There is, for example, never a moment, never a moment when God knows us but does not love us, or loves us but does not know us. Indeed, God wholly knows us because God wholly loves us, and God wholly loves us even though God wholly knows us. Are you with me? That's the power of the gospel. Love and knowledge united in God, in Christ. It is what I believe the opposite Paul says in Ephesians about how God can do immeasurable, measurably more than we can ask or imagine. As God works in us, in his grace, all because God knows us and loves us. How can we shine a light in the world? just do good things, but just to be a social activist? No, here is the answer. We shine a light not in the social demands, progressive ideas or national culture, but in the unity of God's knowledge and his love. Because God fully knows us and loves us more than anyone or anything. You may say, Reverend Shin, it sounds good, but still ambiguous. What does it really look like? How can we practically fulfill living in the unity of love and knowledge in God? I would like to suggest two things. First, to offer a better story made by God. And second, to distinguish between ideological social justice and God's justice. First, let me tell you how biblical justice is different from ideological social justice. Very often today, many people, even Christian churches, misunderstand ideological social justice as God's justice. And as a result, they replace the gospel into political collectiveness and Christian journey into a religious Marxist life. What is the main idea of social justice? The tearing down of traditional structures and systems deemed to be oppressive, and the retribution of power and resources from oppressors to victims in pursuit of equality of outcome. I know. It sounds just, but it is wrong. In the idea of social justice, only two relationships exist, you and I or they and us. In the Jerusalem world of social justice power struggle, there is no life and let life tolerance, no win-win, or even compromise. No place for forgiveness or grace, no love your enemy, no first get the log out of your own eye introspection. No truth, but desire. There is only, only grievance, condemnation, retribution, bigots, haters, and oppressors must be destroyed. In this idea, victims are always right. They are always true, innocent, 
Justice is nothing more or less than being filled with what they want. However, biblical justice tells us a different idea. Biblical justice means conformity to God's moral standard. Why? Because he knows all of us and loves all of us. Unlike social ideological justice, biblical justice means conformity to God's moral standard particularly as revealed in Ten Commandments and the royal law, love your neighbor as yourself. Due to his grace, this part is important, due to his grace and love for us over our fallen nature. If biblical justice suggests a different idea from social ideological justice, what should we do? The answer is simple we should offer a better story made by God to the world. A true story, a story that tells people that our true identity is not found in our skin color, our wealth, ethnic background, sex, or sexual sexual orientation. Yes, we are shaped and influenced by our groups, but our groups don't define us. Our true identity is found in the fact that we are all unique and priceless human beings made by God in his image and loved deeply by him. For God so loved you and me that he gave his only only son that whoever believed in him shall not perish but have eternal life. People needed to hear a story in which everyone bears God's image. Everyone. Everyone has God-given endowments, a creative mind, a heart, hands, a unique personality and gifts. They need to hear that rather than taking on the mantle of victim. God expects each of us to use these gifts endowments to bless others. And to better our respective worlds, everyone, everyone is capable, responsible, and accountable. That's God's will. That's God's justice. If your story tells you that your primary identity is a victim, your life will be marked by bitterness, resentment, grievance, and entitlement. If your story tells you your primary identity is a privileged oppressor, your life will be marked by guilt and shame, or sometimes pride. However, if your story tells you that your identity is a sinner, yet loved by God and saved by grace, your life will be marked by gratitude and humility. People need to hear a story in which power isn't ultimate, love is. People need to hear a story in which social ideas and culture aren't ultimate, but truth is. In the false worldview of ideological social justice, truth and love don't exist. Everything boils down to a zero-sum contest of power between competing groups. But the Bible reveals that for sake of love and truth, the most powerful being in the universe, the creator of all things, gave himself up for us. God's only son in the immortal words of Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 8. They did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. He served us at the cost of his own life, given up on a cross, all because of love and truth. In the real world, many people, including many followers of Jesus Christ, have followed this example out of love for their neighbors because God loved all of us. Many followers of Jesus Christ have still set aside their power and prerogatives humbled themselves because they know God wholly knows us and served others in his love and knowledge. 
even at great personal sacrifice. I pray that is true in your life and in mine. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for today's message. You know us, for you wholly love us. You love us, for you wholly know us. May we do everything in the nature of yours. May we love you and others, not in social ideas and culture, but in your knowledge and truth. And may we know you and others, not in anger and fear, but in your love and grace, so that we continue to live a new story made by Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue the service with a hymn, I have called you by your name. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. This time, let us pray for several things together in silence. First, let us pray for God's kingdom, glory, and righteousness. Also, let us pray for dedicating our beings with our offerings. Let us pray for people in flood crisis in BC. Let us pray for Ebenezer, United Church, his families, and New Journey. If we have any personal wishes and needs, just ask, trust, and listen. He will respond to you. I did not say he will satisfy your wishes. I said he will respond to you in gentle and lowly because he knows you and loves you. Let's pray for a while in silence.
We pray for all those in need, whether in body, mind, or spirit, that your healing light and presence will bring comfort and peace. We pray for Roy Dixon, Angie Fix, Michelle Gillette, Mavis Grange and her daughter, Dorothy Grant, Joan and Clyde's friends, David and Donnelly Gullison, Phyllis Harvey, Monique's mother, Iris, Tanya's friend, Carol and her family, Jim and Joyce's friend, Becky Shields, Rick Saunders, Diane's friend, Tokiko, Joseph and Helen Salins, Joseph Stepaniak, Mary's brother, Basil, Mary's friend, Andrea, Connie's friend, Elaine Leba and her daughter, Andrea. Linda Wilson's friend, Linda and her family. Susan's friends, Joy and Reg and their daughter, Erin, Heather and Will. Sarah and Demetrios. And all those we name in silence. God of grace, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. Amen. Please keep closing your eyes. Let me pray for offering and people. Blessed are these gifts when they bring hope to the poor, food the hungry, comfort the sorrowful. May these gifts be blessed, O oh God, as they become blessings to our members, our church, and your kingdom, and the world in need. Work, work within these offerings, that the world may know your love and justice. With these gifts, we long to see your face and know the power of your presence. Please remember each of us, lead each of us, and abide in our homes, faith, and business, that our lives might conform to your purposes beyond worldly voices. Bless Ebenezer United Church. We may be built every moment and every breath into a body in your way, truth, and life. Also, we pray for our members, especially who are in the midst of physical and emotional suffering and pain. We know that you hear our voices. Give them your comfort and peace and strength. Let them know you are with them as they walk through dark valleys. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us do Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on us as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Before we close the service, we chant another hymn, Come Now, Almighty King.
ascending birth. O Lord, as you bless our builders with the harvest. Now fill our hearts with generous care. That as you will remember what you do for us in the yield of our land. We will ponder what we can do for you through the labor of our hands. May the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the power and communion of the Holy Spirit, who is the embodiment of love and truth, be with you and all things in you. Amen. We conclude our service. Please stay and join us for fellowship. If you are not able to stay, thank you for joining us. And we will see you next week at the church as well as at the online. God bless you. <laughs>